Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Sun Sukun, who is an uh, intern in uh, MSR Theory Group. Um, so the only thing I'd like to inform about him to you is, uh, I mean, because he must have read all his bio in, in, the, in the announcement. <laughs> so the important thing is uh, he was one of the most uh, demanded in turn. Uh, three different labs wanted him, Live Labs, uh, New England Lab, and, and Redmond Lab. And... Uh, Fortunately, he came to us. Uh, he actually chose live loves, but decided to come to us <laughs> for whatever reason. And uh, the other labs didn't want him because they did not know about his talent. But by the end of the uh, uh, internship, uh, ad center folks wished that he might have done internship there. And same, some search folks thought maybe he could have done internship there. So we were fortunate to have him here this summer. Thank you very much for this kind introduction. <clears throat> um, the work I'm going to talk about today is, well, joint work with my mentor, Kamal, and with uh, Mary Tsvinsky, Desney Tan, and uh, Nikhil. And I'll be talking about UI design and economics meeting. And I'll try to explain this kind of new concept um, using two particular examples. Um, so you're probably all used to classical markets like Amazon and eBay. And we know that if we go to Amazon, there's usually a fixed price that we can buy a good for. And if we go to, uh, to eBay, we enter an auction. And most people by today are used to entering a, a bid um, for the good they want to buy on eBay. So these are pretty simple markets. And by today, people are used to these user interfaces to interact with these markets. But there are more complicated markets that need to be designed. And this um, research area that looks at how to design these markets is called market designs. And um, in particular, these people doing market design specify the rules of a market. So for example, eBay is, is not a product out of uh, coincidence. Now, people actually uh, thought very hard about which rules to put on this market. For example, what should be the closing time? Should uh, there be a fixed time when eBay, uh, an eBay auction closes, or should it always be extended by 10 minutes when a new bid comes in? So these are very important rules. Another rule is uh, spectrum auctions. People, a lot of people are looking into how to design these uh, auctions for, for combinations of wireless bands, and there are different rules um, concerning these auctions. Stock market has been in the news for the last year in particular, whether to put new rules onto derivatives trading or how much leverage there should be um, allowed. And ad auctions um, is, is a popular example for, for Microsoft, Google, and Yahoo. Should we charge advertisers based on uh, impression or based on clicks or based on acquisition? So these are all the rules of the underlying market. And there's this research area called market design to, to figure out what's the optimal design of a market. So, so far, people have looked um, towards economic theory to guide their thinking about how to design these markets. And we can learn a lot from game theory um, to think about the incentives and the strategic um, actions that uh, agents take in these markets. Mechanism design is kind of the mathematical formalization of, of a very small subset of this market design area. And in general, we can learn from microeconomics to, to inform ourselves about the, what's happening on these markets and what properties are desirable on these markets. And classical goals and challenges at the same time that economists try to achieve when doing this market design is, first and foremost, they often try to achieve efficiency, meaning we try to allocate the, uh, the resources to the in individuals that value them most. And the second um, uh, challenge we are dealing with is incentives. We have to take uh, the strategic behavior of our agents into account, meaning we, we will assume that they will optimize their individual utility. And if there's, an opt if there's a possibility to, to cheat or to strategize in our market, they will, uh, take, um, they, they will do so. So there is, <coughs> sorry. There is um, kind of a small gap between theory and practice when it comes to market design. 
because the standard assumptions that the economists assume are not often satisfied in the real world. In particular, um, economic theory assumes that the agents know their whole utility functions. They know for each possible choice they could make exactly what kind of uh, utility they would have for that choice. And they assume that the agents are fully rational, meaning in every situation they will always take the action that maximizes their utility, kind of assuming an un unlimited amount of computation uh, to their disposal. Well, in practice, it's a little more complicated. We know that agents are, uh, humans in particular, and, but computers as well, are boundedly rational. So in many situations, agents take suboptimal actions and agents' brain cycles are actually expensive. We don't have infinite amount of computations to our disposal. So this is what we've learned from, bounded re from the research on bounded rationality, and there are certain models that can take this into account. More recently, behavioral economists have also um, um, criticized these assumptions that the uh, economic theoreticians are making, and they find slightly uh, different criticisms of the standard assumptions that are being made. For example, they find that agents often stick with default choices that we give them, meaning they don't actually optimize uh, their choices maximizing some utility function. They're just happy with whatever you give them in many situations. And sometimes they're actually altruistic or other regarding. They take actions that might not maximize their own utility function, but other users utility function or a combination of those. So my goal in, in much of my research is to bridge this gap between theory and practice um, a little bit. And this summer, I've looked at one particular bridge, um, namely the bridge between the user interfaces and the economics that's happening on these markets. So there's three big, when we are thinking about designing a new product, Microsoft is developing a new product, or we are thinking about designing a new system, there are three important, important components. There's the technology that we develop, and then there is the market design that we choose. So another word for the market design could be the business model, meaning we decide, okay, how much should this product cost? How do we charge users for it? Do we charge them per month, or do we charge them per megabyte of consumption or bandwidth? or uh, do we charge them upfront or ex post? And depending on the technology, um, we can also enable different user interfaces or different, resulting in different user experiences for the user. And what I want to point out with this picture is that there's this very interesting interplay between all these three components that make up the final product or the final system that we design. And uh, the aspect that we looked at this summer in particular is this interplay between the user interface design and the market design. And we want to point out that we think this is an area of research that has been neglected so far. People have designed, certainly designed user interfaces uh, for different products. And as I said, economists have thought a lot about designing markets, but they haven't really considered these two aspects together, although we believe they are very important to consider them simultaneously. So here's a slightly more involved picture to, to point out why I think these user interfaces are so important for the market design. Um, on the left side, we have the market, and I'm saying it's it has these two important components, the user interface via which the users will interact with the market, and the market design which specifies the rules of the market, how the users are charged and, and what the prices are and so on. And the important point is that the, depending on which kind of user interface we choose, this uh, different user interfaces will invoke different user models. What I mean by a user model is some kind of psychological model that depending on the interface we provide to the user, we will put the user into different mindsets, uh, meaning he will, depending on which mindset he's in, he will then take different actions, and these actions influence the, the overall market again. So there's this important loop, and because the user's actions and the market together result in an equilibrium, the point I want to make is that choosing the right combination of user interfaces and market designs can lead to very different equilibria, some desirable and some undesirable. Yes? I don't understand what you mean by user interface. So is the assumption that given two interfaces, the set of options available to the users uh, is the same, except they are presented differently? Or if you're also talking about interfaces taking some options away altogether, and, and that seems like a more forced function than yeah, I don't want to restrict it to the former you said, but allow it more generally. It could be two different user interfaces that allow the user to take the same actions but present them in different ways. But it could also be a user interface that actually does, does, takes away some of the actions.
but um, perhaps tries to simplify the user interface that way or gear the user into a certain you know, corner of the user model space that we want him to have him in. Um, and there might be some trade-offs between taking away actions but simplifying the user interface and uh, getting a desirable uh, feedback loop in the system. Yes? Have you looked at the user interface tricks that Ryan Air is playing in Europe? Uh, you mean like that users should pay for... Is they essentially the default you to expensive options and now the European Union is beating on the head with a club? Yeah, yeah I, 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 have, I think I've read a couple of news articles about them. It's very interesting. Um, okay, so this is the point I wanted to make about this general imp important interplay between user interface design and market design. And in this talk, I want to um, kind of exemplify this, this uh, problem or this research area uh, using two particular applications. One is a, a toll bridge pricing problem that we've looked at, and that's more uh, of a theoretical analysis. And the second one is a peer-to-peer -peer backup market, which is a very applied research project, and there's actually an existing system that we, that we studied. And both are, as I think, nice examples to illustrate this important interplay between the user interface design and the market design. So the first one is uh, this toll road pricing project. So actually on Washington State uh, Route 167, this is already in place. Um, everybody knows these carpool lanes that you're only allowed to use with two or three drivers. But on this highway, you can actually use the carpool lane also if you're a solo driver, but you have to pay a, a fee. And this, this toll um, is uh, dependent on the traffic. So it changes dynamically and it varies between 50 cents and $9 <coughs> depending upon the traffic. The current rule that um, they are using is they're setting the fee so that the toll lane is always guaranteed a minimum speed of 45 miles per hour. And um, so... Don't charge based on the make of cars that they see. <laughs> <laughs> no, they don't pay, uh, charge based on the cars. No. Um, so there's certain technology uh, in place to, to enable this. So the cars have to have a radio tag to get, um, to get noti noticed when they pass um, the entry of the, the toll lane and the events are automatically recorded and billed uh, later and automatically charged to the credit card. So the questions that arise are here because we have this um, research. What does this exactly mean? It means that if I want to drive there, because I was just there a couple of weeks ago and I really didn't understand these dollar marks. Ah. <laughs> uh, yeah. successful. What the, <laughs> <laughs> okay, so bad, bad user <laughs> Um, what this means is if you are a, a single... You buy something in advance, place it in your car, and then yeah, register yes. it. Please. Yes. So... The deception is tied on, on our car. This is sticker. Yeah. How can they distinguish whether I'm a single driver or not? Yeah, they have some <laughs> monitoring in place. <laughs> uh, you know. this, that's the same mechanism. I don't understand how it is. If I pay, it's a huge doll. <laughs> <laughs> We get, we get to the strategic aspects of the market design later, uh, later on, so a very good question. Um, so, but the questions we ask ourselves were well, not so much about putting dolls into the cars, but um, the question was, well, we have a choice here um, about what do we display to the user on these boards. So in particular, which user interface should we provide to the user, and which market design or which business plan should we use in combination with the user interface. And so there are a bunch of possible user interfaces. I just want to throw them out there. So for example, the easiest one is the user sees the price of the toll lane he has to pay. That's the current interface. We could also show the user the price and the speeds on, the, on both lanes. That's more information than they're getting at the moment. Uh, we could show them the price and the travel time on both lanes so the user could compare if it's worth for him taking the toll lane. Uh, we could show the user the price per estimated minute saved. So we would automatically compare to him the toll lane with the free lane and, and calculate the price per minute saved. Uh, we could show the user a price and a minimum guaranteed speed on the toll lane. That might be something the user cares about. Um, or we could show the user a price per minute saved, but now we're changing the business model or the market design. We're not charging him when he enters the lane, but we're charging him at the end of the lane. So that makes a difference if these, so far we've been estimating these speeds and travel times and this time we are actually uh, charging them based on the actual travel times that result at the end. And I get into these um, intricacies uh, in more detail in a moment. So these were the different user models. 
And as I said, different, uh, sorry, user interfaces. And as I said, different user interfaces might invoke different user models. So um, in economics, we normally assume and that agents have an infinite amount of computation uh, to their disposal and then take optimal actions. In algorithmic game theory, we at least assume we ha that the computations have to be done in polynomial time. But what actually happens in practice is pretty much unknown. So for our analysis, we just want to point out that different user interfaces resulting in different user models will, de will result in different actions. And we're not saying we know what kind of user models are happening in practice. We're just analyzing them in a theoretical manner. So we're considering three different computational models or user models, um, starting with a very simple one, just a threshold gate, where the user compares some input, for example, a price, with a fixed threshold that he comes up with in a certain manner. Then we could have a slightly more complicated circuit where there's multiple uh, inputs uh, feeding into an AND or an OR gate. So, or we could have some kind of division threshold circuit where the user performs one division operation and then uh, the output is fed into another threshold gate. And this is just... <laughs> this is, yeah. So, and, and if, you are, if you don't believe that the user can actually uh, perform a division operation, that, that is very, very interesting because we also doubt that he will actually be able to do so. So if some of these user interfaces uh, for, uh, to, to, um, to take an optimal action require the user to divide a number by another number, and if we believe, well, most users won't be able to do that, we can already assert that they will um, take suboptimal action. So we should probably show them a different kind of user interface that doesn't require a division operation. What are you doing in the Q test to enter the <laughs> Yeah, we, we try to avoid that. We want to do the Q test in the lab and then come up with the simplest UI that results in the best actions. Um, so the formal model, just giving you a very brief uh, idea how this works, is we're assuming a set of agents and the total number of agents determines the total traffic on both the free and the toll lane. We have a specific user interface and a specific uh, computational model, and we, uh, we uh, analyze these three components together. Our bridge has two lanes, one toll lane, and the users have to pay a price P to use the lane, and the free lane has no cost. And we assume quasi-linear utility functions, meaning the user has uh, giving a certain time saving T and a certain price P. The user has a linear value for time saving V times T and minus the price P. And here, just an overview of the main results, uh, glancing over all the mathematical details. So if we provide the, this, if we assume a user, user with a simple threshold gate and we show him the total price shown, then we can show that not all traffic shapes can be implemented. And by traffic shape, um, I'm leaving completely unspecified whether we are maximizing social welfare or maximizing social, uh, revenue or what kind of user, uh, what kind of delay function we are assuming or what kind of um, other details. We're saying with this UI and this um, computational model, not all desired shapes can be implemented. And some users might experience regret ex post. Um, if we show the users uh, a speed difference, then again, not all traffic shapes can be implemented, and also the users experience regret. What, what does that mean? Regret. Ah, um, so that means that uh, if, if you arrive at the end of the toll lane, then uh, some users might realize that they made a suboptimal decision based on the uh, based because the, the time estimates, you know. Um, because the user, with this user interface, the user cannot take optimal actions. And um, after he figures out, okay, which was actually the time saving, um, once he has already finished driving along the bridge, then he, if he actually did the, optim the complete computation, he could figure out, oh, I should have taken the other lane. So some users will take suboptimal actions. And the thus... Traffic will always feel that I'm in the wrong lane. <laughs> 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 so, yeah. so what is a traffic shape? Yeah, a traffic shape is, uh, say, that's our way of leaving unspecified what kind of, what the social planner is maximizing in this, in this uh, problem, whether he, he might be, uh, traffic shape means how many cars should drive on the toll lane, how many cars should drive on the free lane, and which users with which utility function should drive where. And you could choose different traffic shapes depending on whether you want to maximize social welfare or revenue, but we leave it unspecified for, for here. And then we show that with a threshold gate, if we show the price per unit time saved, if that is shown to the user, then any traffic shape can be implemented. Users can have regret 
if the time estimates uh, can still be incorrect. And um, this leads me to, the, to this idea, okay, so far we've looked at different user interfaces. Now we're looking at what happens if we actually change the market design. Um, so I already mentioned we have these uncertainties about the actual travel times along the toll road or the, uh, the, the free lane. And there might be a lot of other uncertainties inherent in the problem about the prices the user is going to pay when he arrives at the toll lane, about the absolute travel time, relative travel time, speeds, times, etc. All of these are just estimates. When, when the pre option, is that you that yet? Not yet. That's coming up. So if we assume that users are risk averse and this could mean different things. For example, this could mean that users have a concave utility function for time or money, or if we, uh, if we model the, uh, the thing that um, Kamal just mentioned, that when users think, ah, I've made a suboptimal decision, I'm in the wrong lane, I should have taken the other lane, then you could model this as some kind of regret or penalty when ex post the user realized, oh, I should have taken the other lane. If the user have one of these, then we can actually improve uh, social welfare and revenue by ch switching to a different kind of market design. And this is um, what you all just, uh, just mentioned. We compare these two um, different business uh, plans. One we call pay for consumption. So this is when the payment happens ex ante. The user enters the toll lane, makes a decision, and has to pay the amount shown at that time. The pay for, for, for performance model is the ex post payment. So for example, we could show the user you will only pay 50 cents per five minutes you are actually saving and you're only paying at the end. So there's no risk involved for the user. Um, so the, he will never experience any kind of regret. It could be an option to be considered, yes. It might open other strategic problems. Convoys. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but the analysis of the latter part is still ongoing work. Um, so there's a detailed revenue and social welfare analysis that we are at the, uh, working on at the moment. Other research uh, uh, directions we've talked about, for example, is time shifting. At the moment, I've only talked about uh, shifting users from one lane to the others to, to kind of get the users with the higher utility for time on the toll lane and the users with the lower utility on the free lane. But you could also imagine that you pay some consumers for using a, the bridge during off-peak hours. This is particularly relevant for the 520 bridge. If we could incentivize some users to you know, not leave between 6 and 7, um, this might you know, uh, benefit everyone. Uh, yes? If you're not careful, you have some guy driving at midnight back and forth and back and forth and collecting the subsidies. Right. What happened in the European Union too? Yeah. We, we, we thought about this, and obviously you have to be careful about setting up the prices not too high. I mean, you can't pay them $20 for crossing the bridge off peak hours and then collecting $200 overnight. But there are certainly some things to be considered here. Um, there's some uh, uh, like experiments done in, in Bangalore where they paid users, um, I don't know if you saw the, the talk a couple of weeks ago, uh, where they paid users with a, with a um, with lottery tickets into uh, entering into lottery by uh, when they used uh, buses that came earlier to work than the on peak buses um, so you can actually shift consumers from the peak times to off peak times but you can also make uh, this is kind of an interesting aspect the market budget balance once the bridge is paid off so this is an interesting problem once you've collected enough toll that the bridge is essentially paid for, there's kind of this resistance in the society for keeping collecting tolls for this bridge and then using it for something completely different. So if you can say, well, we're just the market is budget balanced, meaning we the government doesn't actually make money, we're just distributing the money from, so that we are paying people who are driving off peak and we're charging people who are driving during peak hours, this could also be an interesting aspect of the market design. And then there are other extensions you can consider. Um, if you're not considering a, a just a bridge, but, but uh, a network of toll roads with multiple entries and exits, then you get a whole bunch of interesting research problems. Um, so the conclusion on this first toll bridge problem is that uh, the point I wanted to make is different UIs invoke different user models, and the UI and the market design together should be considered when designing the overall system. And shown using this particular sample, um, was that different UI market design combinations have, can have different revenue and different social welfare effects. Um, 
this was the first application of this general design paradigm, which, and now I'm going to get to the second completely different application. Uh, the first one was the theoretical analysis, and the second one is actually an, uh, uh, an applied study, a peer-to-peer -peer backup market. And um, so we've already talked about market-based systems and their UIs in general. Some of them elicit the user's preferences and provide some information to the user. Um, I'm just going to skip over this. And we've seen the user interfaces for very simple markets, like uh, an Amazon market or eBay. But they're also a very complicated market. For example, this is a screenshot from a com uh, combinatorial uh, market, a procurement auction, um, which is certainly a, a, an interface that a, that a novice user could not, um, could not use to, to specify his valuations. Um, so what if we are in a very complicated market and so that novice users could not really specify their preferences using such an interface. And what if we're in, an, in a market where a lot of the users are actually non-experts? And what if the market is actually uh, such that money is not even natural in this domain so that we don't even want the user to think about a market when interacting with the system? So this is the kind of the underlying idea of this work, designing a user interface for a peer-to-peer -peer backup um, application. And the motivation for this is the following. Um, so peer-to-peer -peer backup means I'm trying to uh, do my backups using an online service, but instead of moving my uh, backup files to a centralized data center, I'm storing it in a peer-to-peer -peer system. Why is this even an interesting topic to study? Well, even in 2003, the total cost of data loss in the US was over $18 billion. And Online backup uh, works well, but is very expensive to run. So I think data centers make up for already more than 2% of the US um, energy costs just for um, cooling these data centers. So the idea of peer-to-peer -peer backup is, in a very simplified manner, Alice stores her files on Bob's computer, and Bob stores his files on Alice's computer. So if either of the computer breaks down, there's still a backup available. So we have huge cost savings because energy for cooling, maintenance, uh, hard drives, peak bandwidth usage and all of this can be saved if we use this distributed system instead of these centralized data centers. And um, we actually, so my internship that I did last summer was at Microsoft Life Labs, which was this applied research lab. And they, this group actually worked on a prototype implementation of a peer-to-peer -peer backup system, which is fully working and currently running on my laptop. Um, so that was the first internal alpha was released in November 2008. And, um, and we continued doing research on this, in particular on the user interface to this uh, system. So when, when I designed the market for this peer-to-peer -peer backup system, what, there were a series of challenges for the market design. First, we have to incentivize the users of the system to provide all of their resources in the first place. Um, second, one of the goals is, as always, we want to maximize the efficiency of the system. So every user provides different resources, meaning some of the, his hard disk space, some of his upload bandwidth, some of his download bandwidth. And we want to use those resources that the users value least. But that means maximizing efficiency. And then we get to the strategic aspects, uh, like putting the doll into the car. We want to make the system robust against ma manipulation. And we can inform ourselves using mechanism design how to do this. So and ultimately, one of the design goals last year was, because this was actually going towards a real implementation and not just a research project, we wanted to build a system for millions of non-expert users. Um, this kind of led us towards thinking more about the user interface than we would normally do when we think about designing a new market. Um, this is kind of the first time I, I started thinking about user interfaces for a market. So existing UIs to interact with markets might have fixed prices, uh, like on Amazon, or you, um, they might require you to enter a bid or ask price. And this is certainly good if monetary transactions in the market are natural and good for sophisticated users, but not very good for non-experts in non-monetary environments. And I just want to point out this peer-to-peer -peer backup system is certainly this non-monetary environment. If you want to back up your data, you normally don't think about trading on a market um, and certainly not a non-sophisticated user. So the, we came up with this new... UI paradigm that we call hidden markets. Um, 
And the idea of hidden markets is to hide as many of the complexities of the underlying market from the user while still exposing, uh, while still maintaining this feedback loop between the user and the market that is necessary for the market to work. So in particular, we didn't want to show any prices to the user or any account balances um, because we didn't even want to tell the user that there is an underlying market. Um, and there might be other applications for this hidden market paradigm. For example, um, in the advertising world, if, if you would be willing to pay for an ad-free service or if you, um, how many recommendations would you uh, want to give in return for a restaurant review? There might be market-based systems that we can't even think about yet that might not require an interface like Amazon or eBay, but more of a hidden market interface. And what I mean by hidden market interface will become clear on this slide. Um, so this is the schematic view of what I mean. We have, the system has an underlying market that is fully operational. Every resource in this market has a price. Um, and the price changes based on supply and demand. So space, upload bandwidth, and download bandwidth have three different prices. Every user has an account balance that goes up and down depending on his actions in the market. And there are combinatorial constraints in this market, meaning uh, single resources have no value. If, if you give me your storage space, there's no value to the system because I also need your upload and your download bandwidth to even move files to your computer or back from your computer. So we have a complex combinatorial market, which we don't want to expose to the user. That's why we wrap around this hidden market UI and only expose certain options to the user and want to invoke a particular user model that leads to these user actions and then influences back the underlying market. And how we do this will become clear in a, in a second. So this is the big picture view. Before I get to the UI, I have to tell you a little more about the underlying market so you understand why we came up with this, this particular UI. So the big picture systems view is as follows. Every user in this, in this system is at different points in time either a consumer or a supplier of resources. If you're a consumer, then you have a certain source file that you want to back up. And your file is um, sent to different suppliers and different peers in the system store little fragments of your file. The server only maintains some metadata and coordinates all these actions, but doesn't actually store any of your files. The server only makes sure he knows where all your file fragments are going. And obviously, we want to make sure, even though this is a peer-to-peer -peer backup system, we want to have reliability. So we want to achieve the same or even higher quality of service compared to centralized data centers. And so like a common goal is something like 99.999% availability. That's like a data center goal. And we can actually achieve the same goal in a peer-to-peer -peer backup system with a little trick. Um, well, first, we use encryption to make sure you, you're not worried about security and privacy of your data. Every file is encrypted before it even leaves your computer. But then, to achieve this reliability goal, we use this technique called erasure coding, um, which is this, with this, which is this re really nice technique which takes a file and splits it into a lot of pieces and then runs this erasure coding algorithm which has the property that if you distribute say a hundred of these pieces then for example with a certain parameter any 50 of these pieces might be enough to reconstruct your file. So not a particular set of 50 pieces but any 50 of the 100 pieces are enough. Sorry for this scheme, where are the keys in the encryption state? Um, on your computer. So you are the only one that has the key um, Ah, okay. So in our implementation, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, you're using, we actually use Microsoft Life ID um, as the encryption key. So, you know, if your computer crashes, you still have a Microsoft Life ID account. If you still remember your password, you still get back to your key. So when I log into the client, it actually checks with the Microsoft Life ID server if, if this is my account and then authenticates me. Okay? So, the key, so there has to be some third party where the key is state. Yeah, exactly. And we're using Microsoft Live ID. But important, Microsoft, so the, the, the backup server actually does not have the keys to decrypt your files. You, you're the only one. If, I mean, okay, Microsoft has the Live ID account could <laughs> match it, but you know. So again, what is this this paper from 2004? If it's so, I don't understand. If it's just secret sharing was invented way before that, and also 
uh, source coding where you can reconstruct from any so, so what is this relatively new paper? About? Uh, this paper is about an application of erasure coding to peer-to-peer -to -peer storage systems. Ah, okay. to the, and you know, you, there are certain specific challenges involved in that. It, it's not a paper by me or any of my co authors. Read Solomon codes are laser codes. Read Solomon codes are like, yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So, is it Lee Zhang who's in SPC? I think uh, they are two marks of people. I don't know where they are. Oh, I see. So um, using erasure coding, we can achieve the same high uh, reliability as a data center could. Obviously, we'll have a certain higher overhead than a data center has. So we have to store more data than we would in a data center, in particular because every individual user won't be online 99% of the time. But for example, my computer might only be online 12 hours a day. But still, with if we use something like simple replication, just replicating the file many times until we get this kind of reliability, we might have get to a factor of 17 or 20, while if we're using erasure coding, we get away with a factor of three or four. Yes? I would believe that it's a 12 hours a day were distributed at random, but people in North America tend to wake up and sleep roughly at the same time. Yeah, that's a good point. So the, the ultimate uh, implementation of the system was envisioning to use a geo geographically distributed um, allocation of files. So if your file is split into a thousand pieces, you would want to make sure that some of your pieces are stored in China, some of them are stored in you know, Australia, some of them in the US. But you know, that's not implemented. That's just the idea. Okay. So this is again a big picture overview of what's happening in this market. We have these different suppliers that are supplying the unreliable resources and the market server is bundling them and producing this reliable storage space which is then consumed by, by the other side. And every time we are consuming some of the resources from the supplier, we are actually paying some credits to the suppliers. Every time the consumer consumes some of these resources, he has to pay the market server. And for now, we're going to use a virtual currency market, meaning that there, is, there are prices, there are account balances, but none of this is real dollars. This is just a way of accounting and maintaining fairness. Ultimately, we are envisioning an open market where users could also pay with their credit card if, you know, if they don't want to actually supply their own resources but still want to use the system. And users could also make money if they have excess resources and don't need so much backup space. But at the moment, we are restricting ourselves to this virtual currency market. Yes? I believe the FOL system works a bit like that. It's a, it's a barter trade in internet access. I, that's actually one I, a system I have not heard of. FON? FON. That's what big planet is. A BitTorrent is not quite like this because in BitTorrent we don't have we don't have virtual currency. What you could say what is similar to this is a private tracker. If you're familiar with that concept, that it might be used in file sharing like BitTorrent. Private tracker is one that also when this on a file sharing transaction tries to account very precisely how much have you uploaded, how much have you downloaded, and maintain fairness over time. Uh, so this is kind of similar to a private tracker. But a private tracker is much simpler because there, there's only one scarce resource, namely the upload bandwidth of every user. In our system, we have three scarce resources, space, upload bandwidth, and download bandwidth. So that's why we have a market and why we have um, changing prices and combinatorial constraints. So the economics of this underlying market are actually uh, described in a different paper. That I, so I'm gonna, not going to go into too much detail of this today. Just want to point out the main aspects. So as I already said, each resource has a price and the prices are updated once a day based on supply and demand and we're moving prices towards a desirable equilibrium. And we have a certain robust payment mechanism to avoid these strategic manipulations and the server acts in a very lightweight role as a centralized bank and a market maker. So the server does all the accounting, sets the prices, collects the payments and updates the prices uh, once a day. Um, there are the following five high-level uh, high operations going on in this market. The first three are initiated by the individual users. So at some point, a user wants to back up his file, and this requires the download bandwidth of the receiving supplying peers. Then the files are stored over time on the peers, which requires the storage space. And then at some point, the user might want to retrieve his, his backed up files, 
which at that point requires the upload bandwidth of the supplying peers. The server makes sure that the files are always healthy, even if some of the peers disappear or go offline or completely uh, skip out of the system. So there's always some testing and repair operations going on to make sure all the files are still healthy. And this requires download and upload bandwidth of all the peers that are involved. It doesn't require the keys. Sorry? It doesn't require the keys to encrypt to test. Mm, no, because um, what happens is the, the file is first encrypted and then it's erasure coded so that it can even be, and if then if some pieces are missing, we can reconstruct new pieces without first decrypting the file because it's, it was erasure coded after encrypting. So I want to point out again that the suppliers provide these heterogeneous bundles of resources. Some, every supplier supplies a different amount of storage space, upload bandwidth, download bandwidth, and is a different amount of hours online per day. But everybody gets the same reliability independent of what he supplies. If he is only online 12 hours a day, that doesn't mean his backups are only available 12 hours a day. I mean, he gets this guarantee. Um, now we get to this question of how to design a user interface for this hidden market. So the user model we use is very easy. Each user has an endowment of resources he starts with. He has a certain hard disk space that's free. He has a certain bandwidth capacity. And he has a certain preference relation over supply and demand. So I'm assuming every user has different preferences regarding which resources he wants to give up. Some users might say, I really need my bandwidth because I like watching videos on demand. I'm not too keen on giving that up, but I have a lot of free disk space. You're free to use this. Another user might say, I need a lot of my disk space because I'm downloading a lot of videos. I want to store them, but I'm not, I don't care if my downloads are slowed down a little bit. You can use my bandwidth. Um, so different users have different preferences, and we need the UI to allow the users to express these preferences. But uh, we want the hidden market UI. So the challenges are that because there are all these different resources involved and these different preferences, we have this high dimensional uh, preference space. And as I mentioned before, only these bundles of resources are even useful from the users. Like an just giving me storage space is not going to be useful. And a priori, the trade-offs that the users have between giving more bandwidth or less space are unknown. So we need to elicit these from the user using the UI. So this is the UI. Uh, this is the second iteration of the UI we came up with. Um, so I'll describe the, the two sides of the window in, in a little more detail. So on the left side, this is kind of the view for the basic user. So you could imagine that you have like an advanced view button, which if you want to get to the advanced settings, the right side of the window would open. So on the left side, what the user sees is he can choose how much online backup space he needs. At the moment, he has backed, uh, already used 17 gigabytes of his backup space, and he has another 16 gigabytes free. And he can drag this bar up and down if he wants to increase the amount of backup space he has free or reduce it. On the right side, he can then fine tune how many of his resources he wants to give back in return to the system. So we're showing him in, uh, here where the fragments are stored on his computer. And then we have these three different resources, disk space, upload, and download bandwidth. And there are three sliders, one for each resource. And the user can move the slider to specify the maximum bound of how much he's willing to give up of that resource. And the, 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 the contract is that the system will never use more than this maximum bound that the user is specifying. And on the bottom, we are showing the user how many hours per day his computer is currently online on average. And we're telling him that, well, for this particular user, one more hour per day would give him 2.8 gigabytes more backup, free online backup space. So let me now show you this UI in action. Uh, hoping that this works. This is my laptop's uh, hard disk going crazy. Hmm? I should use what? There we go. OK. Ah, this. OK. Um, so here we see what I've just seen you. And this is the live uh, interface. And the user can now decide, well, I actually am about to back up a lot of data. So if I want to want more free space, I can give me five gigabytes more. And what you saw is that as he increases his free backup space on the left, 
the sliders on the right are also increasing. So that is the contract that we are telling the user, well, anything you want to have, you have to pay for. You know, if you want more here, you have to give us more. At the moment, what we're doing is we're increasing the sliders or decreasing them proportionally because this is the best guess we can, we can make given what we know about the user. If, you use a, if the user decides, well, but I, I really need my disk space, he can also move this slider down and move another slider up uh, in return. Or if he says, well, I'm actually, I, I don't need my disk space, but I really need my upload bandwidth, then he can move these sliders and this moves in return. So this is how the user can express his preferences using this UI. There's no notion of a market yet, right? Um, okay, there are many more details, but yeah, go ahead. I'm curious if you've done any user studies yet on this UI. Yeah, it comes in a sec. Because uh, my, like the, so recently came across a UI where sliders were automatically changing and it was really disturbing. And this is very simple for like just microphone uh, sensitivity control. So if I controlled the boost, the volume changed and the change the volume, the boost changed and it was a little bit disturbing. Yeah, it's, it's, I agree. It's, it's not the, the most intuitive thing because it's something new. Um, and I'll get to the user study in a moment. So, so, uh, yes. So, so the blue bar is useful to give up. So that, that means if I move it beyond the blue, then it won't make any difference unless I move one of the others. Ah. So. See, you did the IQ test very well. <laughs> so this is exactly what this is supposed to mean. And not all of our users got this, but I'll get to this in a second. So yes, I move, as long as I'm moving my slider in the blue region, I get more and more free space. As, long as, as soon as I hit the gray region, I don't get anything more. And I get this little pop-up telling me, sorry, you first have to give up more of the other resources. Why is that happening? This is happening because we have this combinatorial constraints on the market. And this is, this, this is saying you, well, thanks for giving me 855 kilobytes of upload bandwidth, but I can't really use that resource if you don't give me more of your download bandwidth or more of your space. So you will see as I give more download, okay, this is, at the moment it's maxed out, so you know, this is now showing this more clearly. So I move, now nothing is happening anymore, but as I give more disk space, the blue bar on the upload bandwidth slider is also increasing again. So that's, that's the visual representation of the combinatorial constraints on the market, still without talking to the user about any market. Uh, these two terms, useful to give up, not useful to give up, he got it immediately. Not everybody got it, but this is the best thing we could come up with at the moment. Okay, this shows you the combinatorial constraints of the market. Um, another IQ question, what happens if I reduce the slider upload bandwidth all the way to zero? How much free online backup space do I get? Zero. Yes, so, exactly. So this is, I mean, not every user thought that would happen before moving the slider, but the nice thing of the UI is, if he doesn't think so, well, he can just try out and he will figure it out, he will see what happens, and then he can try to figure out why it happened. So the UI actually doesn't let the user allow, doesn't let him, doesn't allow the user to choose an impossible setting. It only allows possible settings, and you know, if the, if the user wants to have 25 gigabytes of free space, he has to move the sliders until he finds a setting that is actually viable. But, but you already have 17 gigabytes used, so what happened to that? Right, so the contract at the moment is, Okay, if you reduce your sliders, we don't start immediately deleting all your files. The, the, the contract is, um, you know, we give you a grace period of, say, four weeks, and we, we immediately send you an email once you click OK, saying, sorry, your account is currently decreasing. If you don't do something about it, in four weeks, we will start deleting your data. Okay. But you get the grace period. Okay. So the average online time is historic. Is, is the average over the last 100 days of, his, of how long the computer has been online. Yeah. And to change that, okay, many users tried clicking on here, but to change that, you just have to leave your computer online more often or less often. Um, so the last detail I want to show of this UI is that, remember, the different resources have different prices attached. And the way for the user to figure this out is the following. If he moves the sliders, say he moves the upload bandwidth slider and he sees how much more backup space he's, he gets. He sees, oh, I just move this a little bit, I get a lot more backup space. If I move my space slider a little bit, I get a tiny little bit more of backup space, but not much. So what this is telling the user is, well, at the moment, 
the price for this resource is very high, the price for that resource is very low. Probably, I'm guessing, because everybody is giving a lot of space, nobody wants to give up upload bandwidth. That's probably why we, as the market designers, set the price for upload bandwidth very high, because we want to incentivize users to give more of that resource. <coughs> Again, this is kind of a way to incentivize the user to move the sliders in the de desired direction, still without talking about a market or prices. Yes? But then expect to see on the maximum disk space it not being the full range. It would be, I would expect to see not useful to give up something less than yeah. the full so bar. If that was the at the moment, the semantics of the maximum here is the, the amount of free space you actually have on your, on your disk. Um, you know, in an actual implementation, you would perhaps think about, okay, do you want to show, okay, this is really your disk space, this is how much is currently already occupied by your own stuff, and, okay, the, the current semantics is this is the maximum free you can give up. Not a use case indicator of how much you really want to value that. Yeah. Or incent them to give it up. Right. The, the blue says, uh, when, whenever the slider is in the blue region, giving that much resources is, is useful to the system given the other slider settings. Okay. Now we get to uh, the usability study because, okay, we came up with this UI, but is this actually uh, useful? And in this usability study, we asked three questions. Uh, the first one, asking more generally, is a peer-to-peer -peer backup system even something anybody would want? So is there even a significant number of users for whom using this peer-to-peer -peer backup system is a preferred alternative over a server-based backup system? The second question was, is there a significant number of users that would value such a market-based approach? Um, um, what I didn't point out so far, you could also have a peer-to-peer -peer backup system without a market, and you would just fix the resource ratios that everybody would have to give up and force everybody to give the same ratios. You, would, you wouldn't need the complicated UI, but you would also lo lose some of the freedom. And the first question is, is our user interface actually a usable instantiation of this hidden market paradigm? And how did users manage to, to work with this? So this is a quick overview of the methodology. We had a pilot study involving six users and then a usability study involving 16 users, all of them recruited um, from the Puget Sound area. From the 16 users, eight females, average 839. We had a huge uh, you know, um, variation between 22 and 66 uh, years old. And before the study, we uh, came up with two segments that we wanted to test novice users and expert users. And our main, cr main criterion for the expert users was that the expert users had used a peer-to-peer -peer file sharing software before and had modified the, uh, the upload or download bandwidth, maximum upload or download bandwidth they would provide in that client. And we thought somebody who had done that would kind of have an, you know, a certain advantage of using our, our software and would prob probably also be the kind of users, a user who would use a peer-to-peer -peer backup system if we would actually launch this as a product. And, but we also wanted to test the novice users to see um, how would somebody who has no idea about peer-to-peer -peer file sharing and bandwidth um, uh, react to such an interface. And the study design was as follows. We gave them a 30-minute pre-study survey asking them a bunch of questions about backup, online backup, peer-to-peer -peer backup. Then there was the 45-minute interactive part where we gave them a bunch of tasks, and then another post-study survey. Um, these are the results about the first questions. Are peer-to-peer -peer backup systems actually useful? Does anybody want them? Just a qu quick points I, I collected from the study. So 11 out of the 22 users were concerned about the cost for online backup service. 40% um, of Windows users have more than half their hard disk free. Uh, this is actually a data point we got from a, from a different study, just to show that um, you know, these users can actually provide some of their resources in exchange for using the backup service. 13 out of the 22 users would, be will would not be willing to pay more than $50 for an online backup service uh, that we described to them in some detail. And the current market price for the service we described to them is $120. So these users are certainly price sensitive and, and 12 out of the 22 users said they would consider using a peer-to-peer -peer based backup service. Yet, you know, common concerns about the service were, were security, privacy, reliability, uh, which is certainly understandable. What, what did you tell the users about security, reliability, and privacy of the peer to system? We had a two-step uh, question. The first was we just described them the very basic concept. Peer-to-peer -peer backup, you're storing your files on other people's computers. And then what do you like about this idea and whatnot? And then they 
raise their concerns. And then we describe the system in more detail, uh, saying, okay, now, it's a Microsoft offers this service. Your files are encrypted before they leave your computer. They are split into hundreds of pieces, geographically distributed, and so on. Then we ask them again, how do you now trust, uh, how, how, what do you believe how secure and safe the system would be? And you know, still people said, um, no, I still have questions about security and privacy. Um, but interestingly, um, after describing to the user this system in more detail, they gave a similar, uh, the same ratings, I believe. 18 out of the 22 users gave the same ratings in terms of how much do they trust the security of the system. When it was a Microsoft peer-to-peer um, -to -peer backup service compared to a Microsoft server-based service. So for 18 people, it didn't, they were kind of convinced that they were, would be equi equivalently secure or safe. As long as they have someone to sue. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, it's, yeah. a, it's actually a very relevant point because, I mean, reliability has to be absolute. A user has to be able to get his files back and quickly. Yeah. And if you're talking about splitting your files to hundreds of, hundreds of pieces, mm -hmm. you want to compare the cost of just the hard drive or an array, RAID disks and so on, to the cost of maintaining this legend of who has which pieces and duplicating whenever needed. And yeah. That's, so that's, that's, a, that's a... It's not cost effective. It does not? Okay, we, so we did the cost analysis okay. for that. It's that don't, don't get me wrong. No. The, the market model is very, very nice. It's just the practical a aspect of using it, using peer-to-peer -peer back backup sounds very problematic. There are many problems involved, I agree. And yes, we need more bandwidth traffic than using, uh, uh, using server-based. We need more hard disk space. OK, managing it would, you know, a computer does that. Um, that. That also costs. Right. And a laptop is down, you need to, it had some, some stuff on it. You need to, to replicate whatever that stuff was in order to maintain a certain capability of. Yeah, this. I agree. I mean, there are many costs involved. The cost of data centers are really huge, and so the, there's this, this trade-off. I would argue that in the, in the whole economic analysis, the uh, disutility for the users for giving up their resources are the larger factor. So the disutility for actually having to give up my bandwidth and my storage space, I think, is larger than the, than the you know, economic disutility of having more bandwidth usage and, and, and this kind of stuff. And this is kind of the thing we, we try to this, that is hard to elicit with such a user study. You would have to do like a longitudinal study to figure out would users actually like is, using such a system and giving up their resources even when it comes to large amounts of space and bandwidth, or would they at some point experience too much of a distance? The point he's making is even building such a peer to peer backup system is very, it's going to be very complicated. Well, it's already built. I mean, it's, the system and is already working. Operating it at the scale with, at which it needs to operate. The scale, I mean, the, the, the nice thing about P2P -peer is that the scalability is much better than any server-based system, right? Because, I mean, you have one or two or three servers, you do a little bit of load balancing, of course, but then the large scale is distributed peers, which, as per our assumption, have Storage. resources they are Storage not... Scales, but the reliability and the complexity of keeping it, that doesn't scale. Well, but you know how erasure coding works, and well, I mean, we let's, can. Let's it's a it's a long not, discussion. Yeah. It's a long discussion. Yeah. So it has nothing to do with the model. It's just yeah. uh, it's applicability. Yeah. Yes. So, a uh, quick side question. So, I'm just curious. So, what uh, what does this hundred and twenty dollars buy you that you that beyond say Gmail or something, which a lot right. of people use? For I think that the hundred twenty dollars service is currently uh, unlimited online backup for an individual user. And the way we described it to the user was you get 500 gigabytes of free backup space, which I see as unlimited to these kind of users. You know, more than they need. Yeah. OK, now we get to the usability question. Does this hidden market actually work? So we tested the users on 11 scenarios or tasks that we gave them in increasing complexity. And we asked them to think aloud. And I was listening as they were thinking aloud and observing the, uh, how they were interacting with the UI. And we tested four different user models or comprehension categories. The first one was what I call give and take. So the question, do they understand that the, the whole peer-to-peer -peer aspect of the system? Do they understand that if they want to get more 
online backup space, they have to give more of their own resources. And do they, can they set the sliders to, to realize that? The second question is the combinatorics. So this is already kind of challenging. Do they understand that only bundles of resources are valuable, that they can't just give zero of one resource and, and maximum of the other? The third one is the most challenging. Do they discover the fact that different resources have different prices? And if they discover it, are they then able to uh, to utilize the fact that different resources have different prices to their advantage. And the fourth one is kind of a, 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 a check whether after they've interacted with the user interface for a longer time, have they now learned the combinatorics if, if they didn't understand the combinatorics at the beginning when they started using the system. Um, and this is the overview of our results. Um, so the give and take, essentially 16 out of 16 users understood. You know, every user was able to use the left side of the window to, to specify how much he wants. He was use, uh, able to use the right side of the window to, to set certain bounds, like saying, OK, I want 15 gigabytes of free space, but I don't want to give up more than 70 gigabytes of my backup space. And users understood how this was interacting with each other or figured it out. Combinatorics was much more challenging. Nine out of 16 users figured this out completely. And, and so uh, seven out of them were significantly confused or did not understand that they could use, move one slider up and one slider down and how these were interacting, at least at the beginning, at the, first, at the task number three and four. The prices was the most challenging aspect. Only seven out of the 16 users discovered the fact that different resources have different prices, meaning they, by moving the sliders, they found out that moving one slider had a larger effect than moving the other slider, and which admittedly is, is something that's not easy to discover. And then also these seven users successfully used that fact for their advantage. And then at the end of the study, we had two more users that by the end of the study understood the combinatorial aspect of the market. Um, so what do we take away from this? Um, so I want to remind you that the UI that we tested was the advanced settings UI, right? So assuming that only half or less than half the users actually go to the advanced settings, this is not as bad as it looks, like, like the numbers sh giving you less than uh, uh, half the users' success rates here. Um, if the users understand give and take and the combinatorics of the market, they can already completely express their preference, not completely, but uh, to a sufficient degree of detail, express their preferences and operate the, the system to, you know, to, to specify how much online backup space they need and specify the limits on giving how much of their own resources they want to give up. The fact that I'm, I'm going to get to the price problem in a, in a moment, the implication of what's, what's, how problematic is the fact that nine users out of the 16 did not fully understand the prices aspect? Um, yes? Keeping on interrupting, but I'm just curious, how do you, I mean, how do you determine whether the user understands the prices then? Yeah, so, for, um, for each of the tasks, I had two or three scenarios, and the, the, the criterion was you know, to be a success for any, any one of the tasks, you had to be successful on, all, on either both or all three of the scenarios. And I determined whether it was a success or a failure uh, by a combination of you know, looking at, for every scenario there was an optimal setting, and I, by looking which setting he chose, and I also recorded it, I could see, did he actually find the optimal setting? But I went a step further, but because they were thinking aloud, I was listening to how they were thinking about the UI. And if they actually found the optimal setting, but didn't found the setting accidentally, but not understanding the process, I still declared it a failure. So this is a you know, more yeah. pessimistic view of success. And, and that's sort of a subjective one, right? Because you know, their understanding might be somehow kind of different from ours, but linked to the same. Right. So, I, I could go into more details how I determined whether they understood it or not. But yeah. Um, okay, I'll, I'll jump over this in uh, regard of the time. And uh, oh, okay, the so market versus non-market. Um, after the study, after they, we've you know put them through these eleven different scenarios, and they were really exhausted of solving these complicated. I mean, these, some of these tasks were really challenging. Um, we asked them, okay, how would you like an interface with, without all these sliders that would only give you, you know, one slider up and down? And uh, 
Well, so where is my conclusion? Okay, users slightly preferred the market-based interface, 3.3 on a five-point Likert scale. Um, and then we described to the user, but, but a sig significant number of users really liked, you know, said, oh, I would really like a user interface that's not so complicated. I just want to tell you how much I need and then take care of it for me. Then we described to the user a certain scenario where, um, you know, one, where the more complex interface would give you more freedom in specifying your, your, um, your preferences and would actually allow you to do certain operations that the other interface wouldn't allow you to do. And then the, the rating increased from 3.3 to 4.0. So the conclusion is um, some of the users realized the benefits of having the more complex UI. Some of the users didn't realize it, and some of them realized it upon our description of certain scenarios. And then they understood, yes, in certain scenarios, it could be useful to have a more complex UI. What the users didn't understand is that if they didn't like the complex UI, they could always just use the left side of the window. I mean, that, is, that would be what the, what the non-complex UI would look like. It would just, just allow them to do this and not even allow them to move any of this. But they, they, they dis, some of them disliked playing with the sliders enough so that they said they want a simpler UI. Yes? You say about it, explaining uh, problematic scenarios to the users looks remarkable like, like, like push polling in politics. Right. So, I mean, don't put too much weight on this number. You know, it, it's, it's a result of me explaining them a certain scenario and then asking them, okay, do you still think or not? Yeah. Um, so the, so the results from the usability study are uh, more interesting for me and the implications for the future UI design. So first implication is the concept of what do I get and versus what do I give up is already challenging for some of the users. I mean, some of the users, the first time they, they open the UI, you know, are uh, overwhelmed a little bit and it takes them a while to figure it out. Um, but the positive side is that the left side of the UI works very well, every user can, can set that. And you know, even if, if the user doesn't understand the right side of the UI, he can still specify how much he needs and click OK. And what um, the results would have been like the right hand sliders will do an effect like the, in, in the iPhone, so it bounces. Oh. That's <laughs> 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 version two. Yeah. Um, so the combinatorics, I mean, that was a, one of the main focus for the UI design, how do we represent the combinatorics in a visual way? And I thought that we, we came up with this new slider design that I, you know, and with this blue and gray shading of the sliders, and I thought this is a nice way of representing the combinatorics visually. It worked for 11 out of 16 users, it didn't work for five out of 16 users. So th there's a question if we can still simplify this to the user and, and, and represent it in a more intuitive way. Interestingly, uh, but there was at least some learning effects going on. So even the users who didn't understand it the first time understood it after playing a while with the sliders. Yes? Uh, how computer naive are these users? Do, are, do they have computer science degrees? Are they, no, uh, you... nobody has a computer science degree. Um, uh, 16 users, eight experts, eight novices. The experts were allowed to have some technical jobs. Um, Okay, I think they actually were allowed to have computer science degrees, but none of them had. I know what jobs they had. Um, but some of them, you know, the eight experts had used peer-to-peer -peer file sharing software before, so they were reasonably sophisticated. But interestingly, if you look at this um, table, for example, for who got the combinatoric aspect of the, the, of the problem, I mean, the experts actually did worse than the novices. So that was also one finding we had, that our segmentation that we made into experts including <laughs> <laughs> worse or better. Right. <laughs> Stealing this by 30 would be nice. Right, right, right. Um, still, I think, okay, there's no statistical significance behind these numbers, but still, the fact that this is not eight out, 8 out of 8 and this is 3 out of 8, but it's, you know, in similar ranges. Um, it's really, I mean, you, you think... The, the, the standard thing is... People say there's no statistical significance, and then go on to use the data anyway. <laughs> 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 once you say, you know, it, it should be like, you know, in in a, in a court, you know, once some evidence is ruled as inapplicable, we're, we shouldn't be allowed to see it. <laughs> well, there's 
there is no statistical significance behind it, but I still, in addition to, the, to these numbers, I also have the observations from, you know, observing the 22 users. And that, that's... The same insignificant cluster of small numbers. <laughs> or so, another point. Actually, in usability studies, it's very common to have small, a small n, because after you run a certain number of people, you see the same problems over and over again, and so you don't, you don't learn anything. And this was just your standard first-time usability study, so it made sense when we were in small numbers. Yeah. And the, I just wanted to, the thing I observed, whether it's statistically significant or not, but I observed it in, is that some of the tasks were really challenging, and it, they were more of an IQ task uh, in testing how smart the person was than testing whether the person had used peer-to-peer -peer file sharing before or not. So... Um, Th that was my personal observation from looking at these 22 users. So maybe that in this type of test you have a lot more concentration than in survey. Uh, say that again, what do you so, mean by concentration? So this is trying to marry from our view, that perhaps one can justify that in this type of usability study, you know, if you would then repeat with another 16 users, you're likely to get very close results, different from say in surveys as well. You know, you couldn't do a survey. Right. Um, yeah. um, the most important implication for the UI design, or the, the, the largest problem of the UI, was certainly the discoverability of the prices. Um, so that is the first thing that has to be fixed. We have to make it more visible to the user that there is actually, that different sliders actually have different effects on the available online backup space. It's still a second question whether once they know that fact, they can then exploit that fact to their advantage and, and adjust their sliders optimally given the prices. But the first problem will be to adjust the, to, to show the prices more prominently. One way to do this, for example, would be, which we implemented but haven't tested on the users, to show them, um, okay, this is, the, the, this resolution is screwing this up, but um, to, for example, showing them explicitly how much more of that particular resource or that particular resource this user has to give up to get one more gigabyte of um, online backup space. That's tell, at least telling the user that this and this resource have different effects on this. Whether he can then use it optimally or not is, is a second question. Did you consider uh, making the price be a function of the upload and download. So changing the price just for the subscription, you said it's you know, $120 a year or whatever. Yeah. Uh, in, the, in the survey question? In, in the model. So the subscription, whether the subscription fee you. I, I, there might be a misunderstanding. The $120 was, is, is a price that I know from you know, market from current server-based uh, backup systems in the existing market, they charge $120 per year for such a service. This has nothing to do with this service. There won't be any, any fixed charge per year? No, for this, this service will be completely free to use. To use the service, you only have to give up your resources. Oh, okay. that, that's the nice aspect of the service, right? You don't have to pay. Yeah. Um, one interesting finding uh, was that we found by with three or four users, um, the slider directionality confused them. I mean, this is something we would have never expected, but, and this is something you even find with like 16 users, even, you know, if four users think they have to move the slider into the other direction than, you know, to the left if they want to increase something, mm -hmm. then that tells us, okay, there's something that at least some of the users confuse, and I still don't have a good explanation for why it's happening. Uh, one of some of them did not understand the blue and the gray and, and interpreted the blue or the, the gray to mean what they have and the blue what they give up and then it switched directions for them. Okay, I'll be done in one minute. Um, because this is the last important slide, the implications for the market design. So this is kind of where we're closing the loop. We started with the design of an, of an economic market and then designed a UI for this market and then are finding, um, okay, there's some problems with this market UI because the prices are important for the market. Without the price discovery, users choose suboptimal actions, but more importantly, without proper user feedback, the market doesn't work. And um, so what we're currently doing is a, an analysis of the market with re respect to the price insensitivity. How well can the market cope with a number of users not reacting to prices? 
So the market is actually able to cope with a certain percentage of the population not reacting to prices if there's still enough users that do. But the question is, okay, how large can that percentage of the population be? And what uh, do we have potentially have to change about the market design to take that into account? So some initial ideas are we can well, slow down the frequency of price updates to mitigate this effect a little bit. And also in the price update algorithm, there's like a softening parameter we can, do it, we can adjust to take that into account. Um, I'll jump over the conclusions for the peer-to-peer -peer backup system and just go to my overall conclusions. So I showed you two particular applications for this research, new research area that we want to promote of considering UI design and market design um, together using the toll, toll bridge pricing problem and the peer-to-peer -peer backup market. Uh, then uh, there are many more applications out there. Um, Kamal and I have started looking at, at display ads. This is a clean web project um, where you can think about uh, market design and the, the combination with certain user interfaces and user experiences. You can think about there's markets to get your software bugs fixed. There are new micropayment systems emerging on the internet. There are many markets that are about to emerge uh, that need new user interfaces to be designed. Uh, further study in this area will, first of all, reveal general insights about this interplay between user interfaces and market design and economics. But also, it can have this nice effect that if theoreticians look at this, then we are creating this analysis portfolio for practitioners so that, for example, for the Toro problem, if we, if we design a bunch of combinations of user interfaces and user models, from a theoretical standpoint, then at some point a practitioner can come in, figure out, okay, what's actually in my domain the kind of user model or the kind of psychological model that my users are exhibiting, and then what kind of user interface should go with that to achieve a desired outcome. And ultimately, well, it will further the design and, and redesign of existing markets. Um, well, I'd like to thank uh, my mentor, Kamal Jain, for, for this summer internship. It was a really great experience. Uh, and also my other collaborators, um, Desne, Mary, Nikhil, and I'd like to thank the theory group for making this a welcoming place, and uh, thanks to you for listening.